Hey everyone, welcome back to Linux Weekly, daily Wednesdays where we sit back, relax, take that midweek break, talk about some of the fun things going on in the world of Linux and open source. I'm Vin Stone, that is Joe Bryant, and you are watching us live on Twitch, or maybe just listening to us after the fact, <laughs> which is fine in podcast format. Maybe watching us on Odyssey, we got an Odyssey thing, uh, Libraria, yeah. all that fun stuff. We got the YouTube channel we fail to mention all the time, but it is available there as well. And Spotify, because Spotify video is determined to make me throw a chair at a wall, Jill, because yeah. <laughs> it occasionally oh, yeah. transcodes the video when I upload it. There is no rhyme and no reason. Oh. And of course, I sent out you know, an email. I'm like, can you just tell me what your transcoding process is? What do you expect? I can just give it to you in that format. I have the technology. I haven't heard a word back from them. So I'm playing around. I'm like, do you? Because normally... Our entire audio chain is 32-bit float. It never gets converted from after mm. you talk into that and it comes through and it comes in and it gets saved. Everything's just floating point. And that's usually how I export it and I'll make the MP3s from that. But the video, even what I upload to YouTube, is 32-bit float. I'm like, okay, well, I'll just bust that down to like 24-bit. Maybe that'll fix it. No. I'm like, okay, maybe I'll change it <laughs> to standard bit rate. No. It doesn't matter. It's just uh. if it's in the right mood. So my apologies if you're wondering how come... The Spotify video version comes out somewhere between the same time everything else does and the next day. That's what I'm doing, hammering on the button. But Jill, you've been ha <laughs> hammering on a different kind of button, and uh, it's oh, an organizational absolutely. button that's trying to get everybody in control. Everybody wrangled for scale yeah. 19. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, Vin. Yeah, so scale 19x is next week. Oh, my gosh. July 28th through 31st of this year at the LAX Hilton, and you'll be able to find me at the Linux Chicks LA booth number 602, and at the other podcast I do, uh, we're having a booth also, the Destination Linux booth uh, with the Tux Digital Network, and we are booth 901. And for all the viewers here on LWW who'd like to attend scale, you can use the promo code CHIX on the first page of registration for 50% off your scale admission. So that's pretty nice. And I every year, I always tell all our patrons and viewers here on LWW, they can go to scale at 50% off. So use CHIX, just like in the last few years. <laughs> and there's the still time year, available. Pandemic. If you're listening to us right now and you're like, man, I need some scale in my life. You can do it. Absolutely. Last minute purchases encouraged. Yeah. Just don't show up with that ticket. They're not going to let you in. So take yeah. advantage of this. Yes. While you have the time. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. <laughs> so I've been in and out tracking. If you've been keeping track of what I've been posting and working on is that AIO Pro. Let's get the open source drivers. Working with that, trying to track down some like spurious X runs that I, they're not leaving a trail and it's driving me insane. They're not bad. They're not even noticeable, but they're there. And you've encountered stuff like that in your life. Everyone else is completely irrational. It's like, they don't matter. And like, it matters to me. So before I get that video finished, um, I want to get a bow in it. And we were talking in the pre-show, be careful when you take out the GNOME Network Manager because it takes down your network stack. And <laughs> oh. and found that out the hard way and had wow. to go through the process of like, well, where's the keyboard and mouse? Let's plug that. In. Let's bring the entire network stack up by hand. That took a minute. Now, on the topic of that, uh, before I get done with the video, I'm going to do a behind the scenes uh, video for patrons about how I'm because I always thought this might be interesting. We'll, we'll see how it floats, if people like it or not, on how the video is put together. So we're just going to crack open DaVinci Resolve while the video is in progress, and I'm going to walk you through how everything's been put together and some of the thoughts behind it and all that. It's a little bit different awesome. than just, mm -hmm. like, here's an early preview of the finished product. I was like, no, no, no. Let me show you how all of this is stuck together. Of course, using Linux. Now, maybe I'll have that out Friday-ish. No promises, but... Things are in the work. We awesome. <laughs> are going to tell people about a thirsty laptop. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good name for it, Ben. Absolutely. So Linux hardware manufacturer Tuxedo Computers has actually come out with something very uni unique to cool those penguins. The Tuxedo Aquarius is an external water cooler, which was introduced in April with the Tuxedo Stellaris 15 Gen 4 laptop. Now, this is a rebadged water cooler by XMG Oasis. 
And uh, so it's not. We got a little bit of debate yeah. on that. We got a little yeah. bit of debate on that a little because, debate. Um, yeah, like initially <laughs> in the notes, you might you might be thinking maybe confused like this was engineered and designed by Tuxedo and it's not. Where I've seen that, where mm. I've seen that was the because let's take a look at it. Okay. There it is. That's our little brick, and that's the laptop that goes along with it. And I think they're about to feed it some water. Oh, it's so thirsty. Oh. Yeah, it needs something to drink. And it has that <laughs> rather annoying fill cap right at the top. And that's not a knock on tuxedo. That's the other YouTubers have reviewed the um, just blank unit with that yeah. laptop. But yeah, this kit itself, uh, there it is. Yeah. So yeah, this mm -hmm. is the laptop water cooling combination that you know it's it wasn't designed but hey they're able to use it and by all accounts it works very well do you want mm -hmm. it is this something you would ever be interested in like even you a know little honestly Ven, i think a lot of a lot of people are using laptops as as their main computers now uh, as workstations so this fills that need and I'm laughing a little bit because it does make it easier. It's easier to install the water cooler if you're using a laptop than, than if you're building a PC with one, an AIO. So I, <laughs> okay, we, we kind of went back and forth in, that in the notes. Uh, now, yeah. Jill, you can, one of the things that Tuxedo has added to this, though, I do want to point this out. And Jill, you can tell them about it. This is the software okay. for it. Yeah, so that's what is actually really unique here is that the Tuxedo Control Center software um, they developed for it. Originally, when it came out in April, it only had Windows support, but now there is Linux support for the software where you can control the fan speed <laughs> oh, and the there's rain a rainbow and uh, the rainbow the vomit uh. RGB light strip. But what is really cool also is that the Windows software does not it only has certain predefined percentages that you can adjust your fan speed whereas with the linux version of the software you can completely customize it with a slider so that's really cool so they've you know innovated heavily on the software which is really nice to control the unit under linux <laughs> so exciting and um yeah you can see from the video you to connect the tuxedo Aquarius to your notebook, you have to unscrew the two caps from the hose valves on the front of your Aquarius, then screw the two water cooling hoses to the valves of your Aquarius. And now you move aside the rubber cap over the water cooling ports at the back of the tuxedo notebook and plug mm -hmm. the two in one water cooling hose connector into the water cooling ports of your notebook. So what they and got in the back ingenious. is basically yeah. just your standard um, quick, clips just they snap yeah. in like that and you might be familiar with those if you worked with any type of like water hosing or anything like that now mm -hmm. this is only going to work with their stellaris 15 inch notebook which is the True. notebook that you've seen matched with this particular cooler and from tuxedo and that configuration is going to be 2500 euros so you got to keep that in mind and yeah now they they make a point to say you know due to the need to completely empty the reservoir from the laptop and all that. it's your notebook's not really portable anymore. It's kind of your yeah. desktop laptop. It's going to be kind of stuck there. And, but I mean, it will run without it naturally. Yeah. Which and it is easy to disconnect, honestly. And it is, then, but it's you know, making sure it's drained and cleaned. You got to clean you can it. Take yeah. It anymore. yeah. True. So that made me think, that made me think, um, cause you end up with a effectively a stationary laptop, which is fine. I know, we know these people. You might be that person yourself. You're like, yeah, my laptop stays on the desk. That's, that's my computer. It doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. Fair enough. I'm not going to judge you for that. But you know, you have your laptop, then you have the water cooling section. All of a sudden, that water cooling uh, block pump reservoir containment unit is about the size of a small form factor PC. It is, yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so you could take it with you, or you don't have to. You could just take the laptop with you. <laughs> it does cost 199 euros. <laughs> it's a you know add-on edition. I don't know. I want some feedback for that. So feel free to leave mm -hmm. a comment wherever you're watching the video, or to send an email. Why or why not you would want mm -hmm. something like this? Me, yeah. you know, I've seen the other tech tubers review this kit. Of course, it was running Windows, and. Um, 
I, I don't know who the use case is. Like maybe if I was 14 or 13 again and I lived that laptop life and I wanted that, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Well, it is great, of course, for gaming or rendering graphics or doing AI and any heavy loads on or heavy coding and compiling kernels. <laughs> it is great for that because it keeps the laptop nice and cool and um, runs faster. So there are a lot of advantages to it. And just to be cool and unique, it's it's different. <laughs> That's it. That's the one I yeah. can think of that could be a valid one. Like it's yeah. different. Yeah. <laughs> True. <laughs> Not knocking it at all, but that is a product that somebody sees and like, yes, I need that in my life. And if you needed that in your life and you were worried about not being able to get the software up and running on Linux, Tuxedo is taking care of that. So mm -hmm. there you go. Now, yeah. <laughs> earlier this week, I <laughs> ran into something that was a blast from the past. You might remember yeah. a little program. Word perfect. <laughs> Let's... Are you ready to tell the kids to get off our lawns? We should. Uh, we're talking about something, uh, you might remember Novell. I did a lot of work with Novell way back in the mm -hmm. day with R5 Notes installations and stuff like that. But they bought WordPerfect back in 1994. I did a little history lesson on this, which was later sold to Corel. Remember it was Corel? We had, even had Corel Linux back in 1996. Absolutely. That's when Corel yeah. had WordPerfect. And you're like, wait a minute, WordPerfect came with Corel. I'm like, yes, it did. It also came with Red Hat 6. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, eventually WordPerfect 7 for Linux uh, from SDC, Software Development uh, Corporation. That program got me through Unity. It was there. No, it wasn't the GUI version because that is what a lot of you include. Like, Jill, that was your first thought was that GUI version that yeah. shipped back in the, what, 95, 96, somewhere there? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And this is not it. This, this is the old school DOS. Where you mm -hmm. needed the keyboard overlay to put it down and get that. <laughs> oh, oh. Look at that. Me and Ven were trying to remember all the commands that we used to <laughs> memorize back in the day. I have <laughs> no shame. Uh, this is word perfect for Unix. This is what this has been ported yeah. from, updated to terminal based CLI word processing. Goodness. And yeah. <laughs> I legitimately had to play remember how to exit game. I played the Vim game. How do I quit this? I don't understand. I had to Google it. F7, by the way. <laughs> yeah, oh, F7. Okay. And I think, Ven, you said that you had the template for your keyboard. <laughs> oh, way back in the <laughs> day. The I absolutely cuts. did. Uh, you needed that. And it didn't go over my yeah. laptop back then, but I had it. And I set it on the desk. I'm like, that, that, that. And <laughs> this was just part of memory because you had to do a lot of typing. Yeah. But I remember this. I had that at school. <laughs> the, the big template. update for this mm -hmm. was... The bundled terminal definitions, uh, they were kind of a couple of decades out of date, so they've been updated, and there's now a Debian package. So nice. I downloaded it. It installs, I'll tell you right now, it runs on Debian 11 out of the box, and you can do what I did. You can absolutely mm -hmm. install the Debian package, launch it, Google how to quit it, and uninstall it. I'm like, well, that was, a, that was a fun trip. I had a good time. That's awesome, <laughs> I think this is cool. I mean, I used WordPerfect on Corel Linux too and loved it, but I used uh, the the Klee version on DOS, and mm -hmm. uh, it was I grew up using that <laughs> honestly. And uh, what what it had been replaced, uh, WordPerfect replaced uh, me using WordStar back in the day, which even had harder key bindings. WordPerfect is something if you're a certain age, you know, in like <laughs> primary and secondary school, that's usually what was in the computer labs. Yeah. DOS terminals. And um, yep. that was a weird blast from And it's amazing, like, how much you used to be. I mean, you can, it's still workable. It's still functional. You can do word processing as I do everything these days in Google Docs because I've sold out to Google. I'm a mm -hmm. big old seller because I know some like, Rare, you need to try. Like, I've already <laughs> made that Faustian deal. We're yeah, done with that. We use Google Google Docs for our show notes and all the things. <laughs> uh, which I get it. I get it. We've had that. I've had that panic. And I'm like, what, what happens if Google Docs goes down? I'm like, oh, man. Uh -huh. It's yes. going to be a rough day, isn't it? I do need it, some type of like automated backup uh, for Google Docs, but it's not implemented, uh, implemented. So I should say, if we ever come on and do a show and we're just spitballing the entire show, yeah. you know what happened. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, Ben, you'll be happy to know that I make a PDF copy of every week's uh, LWW since I've been on for now over well, four and a half Well, you see, Jill, now years. that you've told me that, I was going to say we were just going to have an episode where Jill waves old stuff in front of a camera. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you've talked yourself out of that show. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sounds good. But, but this is a... This is awesome. I mean, I, I loved WordPerfect for years and I was so bummed when it, you know, everyone started using uh, Microsoft Word. I'm like, oh, WordPerfect was so much better. <laughs> I, I hate writing. I will go back to that again and again and again. Uh, I don't like it. I, the initial, I like the, the first draft, the spitballing, like, pff, the flow of information, that consciousness that comes out of your finger digits on the end. But uh, with me, my background is constructing technical documentation. So, if yeah. I had a system where I could do that first draft and somebody would rip it away from me and I wasn't allowed to touch it, it would be better. But the longer I play with something, the more I grind it down to where it starts reading like a manual. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, less writing is, I don't know. But go play with it. Go play with it. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Linux on Apple Silicon Max is, yeah. uh, you're still, you still got to pay for the um, M1 Mini, mm -hmm. though. We looked that up before the show. That thing's still $6.99. Yeah, it's still expensive. When is it gonna be like two hundred bucks? Uh, when when? <laughs> don't say don't when know. the M2 Mini comes out because yeah. we know that's not true. <laughs> we know that it's it's usually with Apple. Honestly, it's a five to ten year cycle <laughs> of when things come down in price. <laughs> yeah, so this is actually really exciting. We have lots of updates for Asahi Linux. Uh, that you know, make Linux run to to run on the Mac One and the Mac Two, all the um, ARM Macs, and they've really made great progress. And now it's uh, Asahi Linux can boot and run on the Mac Studio and the first M2 Macs, so that's pretty cool. And the distro now supports the M1 Ultra and the Mac Studio, and has added preliminary support for the M2 MacBook Pro which has been tested firsthand by the team. It actually, uh, they have, uh, they said it will, will work on the M2 MacBook Air, but that actually hasn't been tested yet. So if you have a Mac, M2 MacBook Air and want to test it, go ahead and, and file those bugs to the team. <laughs> they would appreciate it. <laughs> and uh, there is a really big thing that has finally been fixed on, on the Macs. And this is very important for, in the Mac ecosystem, Bluetooth now works. So <laughs> there are Bluetooth keyboards Bluetooth and, and mice. Works. Yeah. <laughs> so, and uh, there's still issues with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth uh, coexisting um, properly. Um, so you will have poor Bluetooth performance if you connect it to a 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi network. But they recommend turning off Wi-Fi or using a 5 gigahertz network if you want to use Bluetooth at this time. But of course, they're working on a, a fix for that, and they're calling it the coexistence support of uh, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. So that's in the works. I'm sure it will come very soon. Yeah, yeah. Here's the thing. <laughs> Here's the thing, Jill. Running Linux on your M1 and your M2, mainstream. I don't want to. That's what all the, everybody's <laughs> doing. It. Me, I run OpenBSD on mine. Um, yeah, I think it's really cool that there's OpenBSD sports. Yeah, but they do of course, make an, it makes sense. Yeah, they make a note right at the end. BSD 7.1 was, was released on April 21st with support for the M1 M1 Pro, and uh, that is still underway. That, hmm. Oh, what is the one more thing? Uh, oh, uh -huh. the GPU. Yeah, the GPU kind of works, which is good. I yeah. rendered myself on the M1 GPU using an open source driver. Okay, let's have a look. <laughs> Drum roll. Drum there roll. It. There it is. We. All right. <laughs> no, she's awesome. <laughs> we love her. <laughs> Developer. <laughs> A couple Lena. of things. Uh, <laughs> you're probably not going to be using your M1 or EM2 uh, as your Linux desktop daily driver just yet, because some things still need a little bit of love. Yeah. Like, doom. like the <laughs> USB-A ports don't work. Small problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, legitimately, small problem. Yeah. But the <laughs> Type-C and Thunderbolt ports are stuck at USB 2.0 speed, so it's probably like full speed or maybe yeah. high speed, True. depending uh, which probably not a deal breaker uh, gpu support as we were just saying is in the runs graphics phase of development under heavy development it is functional but you're not going to be firing a blender on it just yet now mm -hmm. 
I was really impressed by this though, because they just said adding basic support for the M2 architecture was done over the course of a single 12 hour development session, which it's good to know that once they have that basic groundwork hammered out for the M1, upcoming revisions, maybe the M3 or whatnot, it's, mm-hmm. it's going to be, you know, kind of a side grade, like hmm, better performance. I'm going to have to completely change anything in the code base, which is nice. And very nice. <laughs> maybe you don't care about any of this and you know what? That's fine. But I want you to think about this. I want you to think about this. How many years of functional mm-hmm. use did people get out of their PPC, P, PPC powered Macs using yellow dog Linux and the like long after Apple just straight up abandoned it? The yeah. Architecture? Are there G4s? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So this is mm-hmm. good. These little powerhouses will be alive and running Linux long after yeah. Apple just says, yeah. ah, what? No, <laughs> buy, buy the new shiny thing. <laughs> My computer collection is testament to that. <laughs> I have all the, all the Macs uh, running. Most of them run Debian <laughs> so or Ubuntu. <laughs> Mm, huh. nice nice <laughs> nice and yeah apple come out with like the m13 so like the m1 drops down to about 300 bucks so i can buy one to play with because like yeah. most people listening to the show like i want one to play with but i'm not paying that iron price apple i can put it next to my apple tv yeah i have seen the the apple one m1 uh imax uh for under a thousand dollars so that's good news that's good news. maybe <laughs> yeah. I, i'm assuming apple doesn't have a scratch and dent because i don't I know Apple. You wouldn't believe this. I don't care what it looks like. It could be smashed and scratched up. As long as it boots, I'm good with it. Yeah. I don't. I don't <laughs> think they sell those. So if you have a, you know, one that's been, uh, I don't know, you've done some elbow drops on, and you want to get rid of it, call me. So we've been over this time and time again. People don't believe us, but for the last, not the last time, Microsoft loves <laughs> Linux. Yes, <laughs> it's been a while since we've had that picture. <laughs> Not to be disputed, they've shown their love for Linux time and time again, just for the naysayers to go, what about the entirety of the 1990s? Oh, Pasha, that's in the past. Um, they can be more evil, trust me. We talked about this on the show a couple of weeks ago. Um, yeah. When Microsoft nuked paid open source applications from the store, and there's been a bit of a revision. And now initially... It was kind of a mixed bag, right? Because mm-hmm. Microsoft said, hey, uh, we're just, because there were a lot of duplicates and just uh, bogus applications from like OBS, like Joe's yeah. OBS and stuff, but they yeah. weren't even bothered changing that. It just said like OBS and things like that. And of course, developers of these projects who were having their intellectual property infringed upon reached out to Microsoft and Microsoft went la la for years. And they finally said, you know what? We're going to fix this. We're going to get rid of it. But in that net, what was caught up was legitimate open because you can sell open source software. Outdoor is a good example of that, completely open source. But you know what? There's a binary available and they can sell that on a store, like even the Microsoft store for profit and which is perfectly fine. That was being cut out as well. But Microsoft has kind of rolled it back a little bit. So what what's in the new updated legalese just paragraph Mm. upon paragraph if you want to track it down yourself let (laughs) me see there was a twitter post yeah last month this is from uh mr sato last month we shared a few updates to microsoft store policies to help protect customers from misleading product listings and uh, yeah they've updated sections 10 8 7 and 11.2 but the big one from this is all content in your product and associated metadata must be either originally created by the application provider which is good. Uh, they even included a link in the document where you can yeah. file a report for intellectual property infringement. And unless they decide to actually enforce it this time and listen to people who were reporting it like last time, we're just back at step one, Joe. I know. I know. This is, uh, yeah, as much, you know, I, <laughs> I really think the open source software should be free on the Microsoft store, but I do understand that some people could be upset that they can't, you know, they, they have what they talked about in the article is a, a lot of the different uh, developers and, and companies that have put, put the open source software on the Microsoft store have spent a lot, a lot of work and time to do that. So they should be compensated at least, you know, with a small amount, a couple dollars. And that is understandable. But I, I still think they need to 
I, I don't know. It just, it still weirds me out. <laughs> I still think it should, it should be free. But <laughs> Open source doesn't mean free, unfortunately. And I'm not yeah. ever going to back anybody who thinks that because that is a True. Windows user's mentality. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> open they don't care. Windows user doesn't open source. The only thing that means is it doesn't cost anything to a Windows yeah. user. They don't care about anything what the outside GTL? of that. Yeah. Nothing. <laughs> that never occurs to them. They're like free. Yeah. And I again I see this argument all the time. From Windows users. Um maybe I'm leaving out some Mac users too, is they will come in to the outdoor forum and just start screeching. Mm. And, what do you mean I have to pay for it? It says open source. That's not le- like it's not legal. Like what? Um, yeah, if you want to provide a binary version or and distribute it on a store with support and all that, and you want to charge for it, do it. It's your software. And but leave the source available in its open source program. If I want to clone the Git or whatever, compile it myself, I'm free to do that. It's win for all parties. There's nothing wrong with that. No one's stopping you. I think the only time people get upset. And again, it doesn't really affect the Linux crowd is yeah. when they only have the source available for free and they don't put out binaries mm-hmm. and you have to pay for the binary. And again, on um, like Outdoor, again, I'm just going to use this because I'm most familiar with that. Outdoor ships in pretty much any Linux distribution in binary mm-hmm. format. You're fine. And that's perfectly legal to do that. Other people, because of the GPL, you can take the source, you can build it and distribute it. But if Adore wanted to, they could put it on a store and it's like, hey, would you like to buy? And this is like how Adore works very smartly yeah. from their website. If you want official support from Adore, you have to buy a copy of Adore and from them, their binary, and that's the only one they're going to troubleshoot, which I understand. Yeah, I and that it. makes sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And now they can again. That's the moral of our story. Okay. So, so that, that is good. You put it in that perspective then. Yeah. <laughs> We can't argue. Microsoft yeah. <laughs> loves Linux. <laughs> we also love everybody helping us do this each and yes. every week. All of our beautiful party patrons. If you want to become one of them, head over to patreon.com forward slash Linux Gamecast. Gang of bonus features you get being a patron, up to and including access to our Discord. We got a special show we do each and every week. You get a custom RSS feed. If you like listening to, you know, maybe an extra hour, hour and a half of content. Linux-related nonsense, we got you covered. Also, the video versions of the Live and Uncut series, right when they're done. Right when they're done. But if you want to wait a week, we have a Live and Uncut channel just for everyone. I'm not really big on paywalls for that kind of thing, but we got a store, store Mm store.linuxgamecast.com. We got Twitch and all the other places that you would typically find podcasts when we were doing this well over a decade. Yeah. um, yeah, (laughs) Wow. It's kind of fun, and that helps us bring... You know, not only the shows, but what we do on the side, uh, try to make high quality, like seriously well-produced content, Linux instructional videos and stuff like that. That's kind of my little side project on top of everything else, because that's needed. That's important. And we've all seen the really poor, where you're trying to find something, how to do something in Linux. And you, you see a desktop that looks like it's been recorded in Miro Vision. Then the notepad opens up for the typing. Yeah. Like, no. <laughs> I'm trying to do a little bit, a little something about that. Trying to, I, I had a very nice comment on, um, I think, one of my uh, OBS Linux Basics videos this week. Somebody says, finally, it's good, well done, produced. And I didn't know this is going to help me get off Windows because I'm, and it was like the virtual oh, background. Awesome, I'm like, that's man. awesome. That's great. That's yeah. what made, gave me the feels like you're making a change. No. Yeah. Making a big difference. Who do we got to think? We got to think some of our Twitch announcements this week. We should mention yeah. if you are a, if you give us some of those Bezos bucks, you can link your uh, Twitch account with Discord and come hang out. Absolutely. We also have IRC too, because I know somebody's like, what, what, I, we don't have Matrix. And yes, we've heard about it. Sorry, Joe. You were saying. Yeah, no problem. So yeah, Gamatron um, has resubbed for 10 months on Twitch. Thank you so much, Gamatron. She's also um, a, a patron in our Discord chat. And we've got PT Dave. He's uh, resubbed for nine months. And we have Mir for 33 months. He was one of our first, our OG. <laughs> 33 months. Yeah, you're awesome, Mir. <laughs> That's like three fingers on each hand. Yes. But we do thank you for your support. Now, Raspberry Pi on a telescope. This is so awesome. 
kind oh, of. This time it's not in a pie form as in eating a pie form. <laughs> I don't know. You can nibble on it and find out. <laughs> I mean, you might chip a tooth, but yeah. we're talking about a James Webb Space Telescope decorative mirror. Yep, and it actually displays the JWST images. So cool. Which is, is kind beautiful. of dope, isn't it? Because if you like mirrors, if you're one of those people that can see reflections of yourself or anything else, how about space mirrors? YouTube yes. Seller Nerd uh, yeah, created, this is a semi-accurate replica of the Webb Telescope. Yeah. And it's functional art because you look in the middle there. Mm -hmm. There's a little something else. That's that's because on the back, there's a Raspberry Pi 2. Um, now, this is using 18 mirror tiles that you can get from Amazon or any place like that. I don't want to play too much of his video, but I definitely want you to go watch it if you get a chance. But I hate YouTube that does this. Come on, close oh, that when you pause yeah. every single time. Yeah. Here he is in the shop, and he, he salvaged a laptop LCD, which is great. Hey, valid use there i think he goes into setting up the raspberry pi and again that's a little display in the middle and what he ultimately wants to do is have that pull new images from the james webb telescope mm -hmm. and display yeah. in the middle automatically currently that's right cool. now it's a bit more manual but there is a github repo all those are going to be linked in the notes uh, about what he has right now would you have to propagate because there's not a lot of photos Yet, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Well, when we get some more, he wants <laughs> yeah, to automate it. Like right more. now, you basically take Chromium and put it in kiosk mode, full screen. He's got a little bit of HTML to make everything cycle, which that is, is really cool. I like that. Yeah, I think it was cool. He used a uh, 15 inch laptop screen and yeah. he said it was a little overkill, but I, I like that. <laughs> he used such a big screen. That's really nice. And yeah, I would like to see a video of 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 it with the the photo you know um there on the uh on the array uh because the the pictures it's kind of hard to tell a little bit on the mm -hmm. pictures because he had to put it the the camera at an angle to photograph it so you could see the image from from the screen and it would be nice to see something a little like right on <laughs> Head on. To, yeah, head on, just so I could see what's going on a little bit more. But I, I know, understand what it is. <laughs> right. So. I mean, you look at it. It's, it's amazing. And yeah, that seller nerd, I, I subscribe to him because this is just an amazing project. And he took a lot of time to make sure that it was, you know, pretty accurate to the James Webb yeah. telescope. So. And to Kudos. attest to what Joel just said, yeah, at like the beginning of the video was like, okay, I was making sure because proportions are like, I would have got that general shape. It might have looked yeah. a little bit like a banana when I got the, but hey, you'd get the idea. But he did it right. Yeah. What I learned is you can buy those tiles on Amazon. Mm hmm. Yeah. And gold tinted <laughs> tiles. <laughs> I really nice. Don't know where I'm going to put them. <laughs> yeah. You need it in your studio. That would be awesome. No, I don't. That's reflective surface, Joel. <laughs> Oh, I Wanted. guess that's a thing, huh? Wanted, yeah. Would it look neat? <laughs> Absolutely, but yeah. Plexiglass? A little bit less refractive. <laughs> you know what I could do? I, I could uh, I could put it up, then I could put some foam over it. And we can, yeah. we'll, we'll know it's there. We just can't see it. Um, then we won't end up with the reflections. But everyone, we got to bounce. Uh, thanks for spending our 30 minutes with us talking about what we got going on jill give them that code one last time for scale because you oh, just yes. got a couple of minutes left yeah to get that uh, in. put code uh, chix in, on the first page of registration it's the promo code for 10 percent off, right? off 50 percent off 50 you know, 50, yeah they get 50 percent off entrance to scale and uh, this, the website's still up so they haven't sold out yet so but you better go out and do that now because i don't know it may sell out it's very possible there you go. <laughs> All right, everyone. We will see you next week. Let's roll some credits. <laughs> Yay! Oh, we have so many wonderful patrons. And thanks again, Gamatron and PT Dave and Mir for uh, resubbing on Twitch. <laughs> Yay! Look at our advisors, Omegas and Artharen. Artharen, who contributed some stories to our show notes. Executive producers. Barbrant, I couldn't read it quick enough. Hey, man, I'm not going to get in your way. 
<laughs> yeah, sea monsters, Ronald, Ryder X Machina, Treadgills, Vera Tenuta. <laughs> okay. Oh, lots of death <laughs> notes. <laughs> I, I can't read them quick enough. It's just a smear of awesomeness. That yes, gets it's every a, one of them. Oh, that's a great. There's a smear of awesomeness. Awesomeness. Awesome sauce. Uh, awesome sauce. A smear of awesome sauce. <laughs> we'll see you next week, beautiful people. We love you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>